If you tell people it's like, like I have an astronaut, then they say, that's cool. If you tell people I build astronaut robots, they say, I have no idea what that is. Composites are the apex material. The challenge has been they take too long, they cost too much. We've sort of reached the limit of what we can do with them. We're designing new types of composites that allows us to break what is possible and go beyond that. If you were to build in outer space, the next generation of spacecraft, what would they look like? How would you design those? What would the systems that are doing the manufacturing actually look like? Here at Overlook Composites, we are working on in space of servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. What I wanted to do was build helicopters. And it took about five months. I read basically everything I could find on the internet that NASA ever published about helicopters. We ended up designing and building uh, this little drone. And then when we turned it on, the the motor mounts exploded in our face at like 8,000 RPM, sending shrapnel all over the place. That's a bummer because that was actually a good part and it blew up because the physics of the part are bad. So then we ended up, you know, needing to think about a lot more deeply the manufacturing and process and how that's tied in with what the drone is. We sort of came to the notion of coaxial extrusion. And that's where you've got one nozzle inside of another nozzle, the internal nozzle putting out the continuous wire, continuous fiber, the external nozzle sort of insulating the wires and gluing the fibers together, as it were. You should be able to produce the vast majority of the vehicle system in one piece. If we have the ability to print with plastic, we can get the shapes that we want. If we can print with carbon fiber, we can get the strength that we need. And then if we can put down the copper wires, we can start running all the motor wires and traces and the antennas. Turns out that's most of the drone and you can do it in one shot and it's highly automated, obviously. The opportunity became, holy moly, um, I'm a satellite physicist. I accidentally designed a satellite factory in a box, a box that's small enough to itself be a satellite. So we should launch this thing. Oh my goodness, orbital composites. We've been on that mission ever since. Now we're working with, you know, folks like Axiom and the Space Force to actually build incredibly large structures in the sky. It's a wild time. So orbital composites, uh, we're building robotic gigafactories for both Earth and space so we can solve the aerospace manufacturing challenges as well as build large structures for energy like wind turbine blades and hydrogen pressure vessels and so on. If you think about our mission, there are three pillars of society, transportation, communication, and energy. With advanced materials, especially with composites and metamaterials, we are able to transition all of these things into wireless domain. Some of them have already been wireless, but they still require a lot of ground infrastructure. And that is the most effective way to build something that is scalable across the planet, then lets you build the technologies that are essential for interplanetary exploration. We sort of have these epochs, right? You have the Stone Age, you have the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and all that kind of stuff. And so now we're, we're sort of getting to a point where we've really maxed out what you can do with monolithic materials. So when you have an isotropic material like a metal and you optimize the heck out of it, you print it this way, you do all this really impressive computer stuff, we've really stretched that rubber band to the limit. So uh, composites are the apex material. So if you think about the largest structures we make, like wind turbine blades, uh, over 100 meters, larger than a football field, composites. The fastest structures, like an F-35, composites. The hardest structures, like your re-entry vehicles, composites. There's no question they are the apex materials. The challenge has been they take too long, they cost too much. We've sort of reached the limit of what we can do with them. What Orbital is doing is breaking through all three of those paradigms. We can make composites way faster than normally done before. We can make them cheaper, but more importantly, we're designing new types of composites with metamaterials that allows us to kind of break what is possible and go beyond that. One of the most advanced technologies or materials in the world is circuit boards. They're amazing. There's a heat sink, there's antennas, there's high frequency stuff, there's analog, digital, computers, memory, and it's also a heater. And how many are actually on your body right now? Three, five, maybe? If we could take circuit board manufacturing and stretch it out, if we can make it 3D, if we can make it a lot stronger, that has a tremendous amount of advantages when we think about advanced 
vehicle systems, advanced energy systems, and, and sort of the satellites of the future, drones, flying cars, all that kind of stuff that we want to build. The most efficient way to build that is with continuous fiber materials where every single thread, every single wire has been put down there in an optimal way. So you're going to go from monolithic materials that have been fully optimized to complicated materials that have been fully optimized. That's running. We call this the Drake cell, um, but we're, we're building uh, shoes for a company called Lore. This allows us to wrap our shoes with carbon fiber. This is actually a pretty difficult problem. I, I know this is a shoe and not like an airplane part. If it were an airplane part, that's a very challenging piece. The geometry is very hard. It's very uneven. It's very lumpy. Actually, every foot is unique. What I've tried to do is to take a lot of mathematical freedom that we can find in computers and then bring that out through how we place fibers onto objects. It's very easy in computer graphics to do all kinds of stuff. It's very difficult to to actually draw in the real world. If you look at what you end up printing, there's really only three shapes. There's bricks, flat plates, and thin walls. Uh, almost every printed object is one of those things. So these are orbital S cells. So these, if you notice, are these big cage-like structure and the robots are in clamps and we can reposition different things around in order to sort of build the printer around the parts that we're making. That allows us a great degree of flexibility. And then you can use a small robot to make a big thing because the ergonomics of motion are enabled by the monkey bars, if you want to call it that. So here we have just an example of a larger system. It's the same fiber, it's the same plastic, the same materials, the same tools, um, just a different size of robot. So we really want to look at the robots like Legos. So you notice the robots are in a different location completely. That's because they're on clamps. Here we're showing a 12 degree of freedom print. It's really 18 degrees of freedom. We're only using 12 right now. We have the big robot and that's actually moving the part, but we could freeze the part and move the tool and print that way, which is what you're used to. And those can also move at the same time. That's when things get exciting. So what you're looking at here is a production cell. You know how long I've been waiting for this, man? No. This thing right here? I mean, 10 years, 10 years, just for this. This like five robot arm, you know, crazy octopus print thing. There's certain times in a startup where you end up with like large emotional payoffs. This thing working is one of those moments where like, man, I've been working on that for a decade. It's just about perfect. We're just about there, but that's a huge accomplishment. This isn't a prototyping cell. This is a manufacturing production cell. So we're going to do a wave of our second product, which is really our drone. These are designed to be uh, basically like an aircraft platform and I could plug different applications into it. If I want it to go faster, I add a jet engine. Um, if I want it to be a radio uh, tower, it's a radio tower. And we just have uh, basically modular uh, payload system. So those more or less just go on the nose here. The fact that it's printed by crazy robots is interesting, but the airframe itself will fly very well no matter how you make it. Artemis is uh, basically the, the mission to go back to the moon. We're working on that to basically put some sensors next to the South Pole. So by putting our systems on the back of Lockheed Martin's lunar rover, our intention is to build about a 200 meter uh, ring gyroscope at the South Pole. What you can do is you can very, very precisely measure the actual wobble of the moon. So the moon is rotating about once per orbit, but it also has a slight wobble to it like this. My theory on this is that if you hit the moon with a large enough asteroid, it will then get a pretty severe wobble, which will then stir up the magma flows, create turbulence inside the Earth, and then potentially weaken or degrade or delete Earth's magnetic field for a time. So we know about magnetic pole reversal, but there are also magnetic field events where Earth's magnetic field just disappeared for a time and they're random and we don't have an explanation. So this is my hypothesis. The Artemis mission is, is one of the things that we're working on here at Orbital Composites, and we're sort of helping some of our nation's scientists push the limits of what's possible. Not all of the programs that we work on are something that we can talk about, but it sure is fun to think about going faster than ever, I think. What is unique about space is we can put all of these things in space and actually have global coverage. Global energy coverage, global communication coverage, and global transportation coverage. We want to connect every single cell phone 
to broadband from space. That fundamentally transforms the entire world. Uh, same thing with energy. We want to be able to beam energy from space directly to all the different parts of the world. Cumulatively, those two things represent two of the biggest markets on Earth. I think there's really two ways to go at a problem. There's the direct and the indirect. With the direct approach, if you start a spacecraft company and you build a spacecraft and you get a mission and then the thing blows up on the pad and you took the direct approach, your company is in deep trouble. So what we wanted to do is build a company where we can survive a launch anomaly and then have still a viable technology to use on the ground. If I build a 3D printer for space, does it print stuff that I want on the ground? Would I use this printer on the ground because it's very profitable? We want to use carbon fiber and compete with sheet metal in our manufacturing. That's what we want to do. This year has been an incredible year for us. Next year, we're going to have our aircraft flying. We're going to have our high temperature materials tested in hypersonic flight. And we're going to be building our first uh, scaled wind turbine blades at 10 meter scale. Not to mention we're building our first small sets. In the short term, unmanned systems of all kinds are important, whether it's underwater, overwater, flying, or in space. And our core manufacturing technology work across all those domains. What we do is align our short, mid, and long-term uh, technology objectives, and they overlap quite a bit. So we are always in sync and following the North Star. The printers actually work. The drones actually fly. Now, sort of the next stage is launch. We have a million things to launch. There's a zillion things to test. Getting these robots upstairs is a next big milestone. And then also we'll just continue to test the advanced materials that we have so that the vehicles that we're producing push and push and push ever more, the sound barrier and uh, <laughs> other things. It's very seldom you get to work on something that can have such an incredible impact to provide renewable energy, transportation, and global communications. Normally, these are three different companies or even many different companies. It's seldom you can see a vision where you can do all of these in one. Why am I here? Why do I care about interesting materials? I got kids, man. I don't know. <laughs> it's just sort of the right thing to do. I mean, selfishly, yeah. like. Uh, you're going to send my robots to another planet. I'm going to help you with the maintenance plan, I hope. Our, our whole manufacturing complex, the industrial complexes that we've built to manufacture chips and clothes and everything like that, was done in a very unfocused and unplanned way. There was no objective. It happened. It grew that way. None of that stuff is recyclable. So you're seeing this accumulation of huge amounts of waste. You, you want to get past all that. If you're going to actually live on Mars, then hopefully all the manufacturing that you do over there to survive is recyclable. The most efficient way to do that is if your manufacturing process, if your printing process is itself reversible. If I could take the wires, the carbon fibers that I'm laying down with my robot and the same tool can peel them right back off my airplane and put them back on a spool, then that is a very advanced process. That's very good. That would be low cost no matter where in the solar system you are. So if we have a advanced materials that let you build vehicles that take you to the edge of performance, and then we give you recyclable materials, we can win. One thing I love about deep tech companies is that you never know where they are. In this case, you're just driving through suburbs in South Bay and then there's like a random building and you go inside and it is a facility that is 3D printing shoes, robots themselves, parts for fighter jets, and is building stuff that will go on the moon. And it's right next to like a park in a super random nondescript area. I love that about deep tech startups. You could build the stuff anywhere. It's amazing. Orbital Composites is making stuff that will go on the moon. That is wild. Before I started S3 and before I started working in deep tech at Astronus, I just thought stuff like this was so inaccessible and that the people that were building this stuff were so much smarter and more ambitious than I was. And in some ways that's true, but the biggest thing I learned from working in deep tech and on S3 is that there's way more similarity between someone who's not working in deep tech or on the stuff of the future and someone who is. Like there, there's more common there than you would ever imagine. A few weeks to months of dedicated focus on a thing and you will become a world expert. Maybe not for research level stuff, but for building solutions with it, that's true. Orbital Composites as a result is one of those companies that 
is incredibly mind-boggling to see. It's dudes in warehouses building really cool robots of the future and rethinking the way that like composites manufacturing can be done on Earth and in space. The last thing that's really inspiring to me about this is knowing that Cole has been working on this for so long and now it's like finally here. I remember there was this moment we were filming. Cole's like kind of waiting to like for, for a few of his team to like set up a few parts of the robot to do a, a test calibration. And he's like, this is such a surreal moment. And I asked like, what's so surreal? And he was explaining, he's like, you know, I've been working on this technology like eight years. Today, like this week is the first week it's actually like fully working. And I, it was just like, <laughs> that was like one of those moments for me. It's like such an honor to be there to film it. Um, yeah, it's literally the reason you do this stuff is to to build to those moments. The future can be amazing if we make it so. All the folks at Orville Composites are certainly making it that way. Thank you all again for watching, and until next week, keep on building the future.